leave that battle right in his hands as you walk and finish out this week, and we will see you on Sunday morning. God bless you.
worship our King. Come, let us bow at His feet. He has done great things, hasn't He? See what our Savior has done. See how His love overcomes. He has done great things. He has done great things. Good morning, Emmanuel Church. I should say good morning, Team Emmanuel. How are you guys doing out there today? All right. You know, um, one of the most compelling reasons 
that we have for trusting God today is seeing his evidence of his power in the past. So you can trust him today, tomorrow, and forever because the evidence is undeniably clear. Let's sing these truths. All throughout my history, the faithfulness has walked beside me. The winter storms made way for spring. In every season of where I'm standing, I see the evidence of your goodness all over my life, all over my life. I see your promises in fulfillment all over my life. All of my life Help me remember When I'm weak Fear may come But fear will leave You need my heart In victory You are my strength And you are goodness all over my life, all over my life. I see your promises in fulfillment all over my life, all over my life. See the cross, the empty grave. All my sin rolled away because of you, oh Jesus. See the cross, the empty grave, the evidence is endless. All my sin rolled away because of you, oh Jesus. Oh, lift his hands. I see the evidence of your goodness. All all of my life I see the evidence of your goodness all of my life all of my life thank you Jesus I see your promises in fulfillment all of my all of my life I should I fear the evidence is here why should I fear the evidence is here Thank you, God. Now another slow one. <laughs> Come on, y'all. Y'all are learning this song. Woo! Brother, sisters, come on down to that river. Guaranteed you'll never be the same. There's a fountain flowing from the heart of the Savior. Bring your sins and all your guilty stains. Let that river of life wash it all away. You've been searching, carrying burdens. You've been lost and looking for a home. You've been drifting, something is missing. You should know that you are not alone. Oh, brother, sister, 
Just come on down to that river Guaranteed you'll never be the same There's a fountain flowing From the heart of the Savior Bring your sins and all your guilty stains Let that river of life wash it all away As you are, no time to wait. Open your heart, don't be afraid. Jump on in, the water is fine. There's healing in the river of life. Come on, on. and time to wait. Open your heart, don't be afraid. Jump on in, the water is fine. There's healing in the river of life. Brother, sisters, come on down to that river. Guaranteed you'll never be the same. Brothers, sisters, come on down to that river. Guaranteed you'll never be the same. There's a fountain flowing from the heart of the Savior. Bring your sins and all your guilty stains. By the blood of Jesus, everything will change. Let that river of life wash it all away. Come on down to the river. Come on down to the river. Come on down to the river. Let that river of life wash it all away. That's the best news ever, y'all. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. You may be seated. All right, Janet, I got to just tell a story. All right, I'm going to tell a river story. In 50, 50 years of ministry, I've only done two river baptisms. One was on the eastern shore, and the other one was in Nigeria, Africa. And the one in Nigeria, after 17 days of preaching three times a day, I had 27 people to baptize in the river. And so we, we came, they came from all over the jungle and all over the village and we met down at the river, and we sang for 38 minutes. And then I baptized 27 folks. It was absolutely an incredible experience I'll never forget. And 27 people found the river of life in the place called Nigeria. It was a very special, special time. I hope you have been baptized. If not, come on out in the river today. I'll help you out, right? <clears throat> we'll break the ice in the Chesapeake. Amen? It wouldn't matter, would it? You just get right. You're ready to follow Jesus. Good morning, everybody. I'm Pastor Stan. <laughs> it is good to have you with us, and it just really is. And we welcome you here to Emmanuel. And when you came in, uh, hopefully you were given a, a packet of material. And if you'll take this card out uh, just give me a few seconds. I'll explain how important this is, uh, just not only here in this worship, but as we use this to communicate and do ministry uh, here in the hunting town and across our world, okay? So please put your name and print your name and address and all of that good stuff so we can connect with you. Uh, over on the right-hand side, it says a first-time guest. Check that box or second-time guest and use this. On the way down, on the left-hand side, is called Next Steps. Uh, Pastor Rick will, uh, as he talks about our new series today and a healthy church and teamwork, all of that, he'll come back to these next steps, and you'll want to know where they are, okay? Under that is our prayer and praise uh, request. You can write to us and share with us. Uh, we read these every week. I tell you that every week. I mean that every week. And when we respond, where it's appropriate. So feel free to share your heart with us, whatever we can pray for you and with you about. On the other side is our serve side. <clears throat> and uh, this is a very, very important couple of weeks for Emmanuel, okay? Uh, we need to act as a team this week, big time. Because we start with Night to Shine on Friday night. And it's still time to sign up. Uh, we'll have a meeting after church and uh, we'll be assigning people. So if you've not uh, helped us out with the wonderful opportunity of 
of giving these special folks uh, a joy, joyful night in their life. Come on out and help us out with that. So you'll want to think about that, pray about that. And then also safe nights, uh, which is when we use this building as a shelter for homeless folks all week long, starts Sunday night, a week from today. So please help us out. Be part of our team. (laughs) This is a big team effort, both of these ministries. So I want to say all skate. Everybody skates on this, okay? Not just folks who have time. None of us have the time to do a lot of this, but we make it because this is what Jesus would have us to do as his team here on earth, right? So join us in that. Think about that. Pray about that. Check that box, and we'll have somebody get in charge and in touch with you. It's so good to have you out. I hope that God will give you a great blessing this day. Let's pray to him. Father, thank you for this good week, opportunity to serve you in so many ways. As the Jesus team of Emmanuel, in a sense, uh, you use us as your hands and feet while, while we're here on this earth. And I pray that we can do that as a church with all our heart and all our soul and all our mind. Bless our time together, Father. Thank you for these wonderful songs that lead us and express our heartfelt faith to you each and every Sunday. In his name we pray, amen. Amen. Let's stand and sing together. Have you made a decision to follow Jesus? Whether you've considered becoming a follower of Jesus for the very first time, or maybe you've surrendered your life to him in the past, but somehow you veered off the path. Perhaps you've just been busy with life like we all are, but you realize now that, you know, it's time. It's time to commit your life to Jesus now. It's time to give him your everything. It's time to follow his path, take his ways and follow him. So let's declare our decision together and sing our commitment to him. Bring. I will give to you my 
yourselves. Well done. Now, didn't it feel a little wrong to dress like this for church in the morning? I, it was sort of like eating breakfast food for dinner. It, it was, it's so wrong, but it's so right. Amen. And so let me just let you know how we're going to do this today. Um, I'm going to preach a little bit and then we're going to sing a little bit more. And then at the end of the service, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to take a three point shot, which is about four rows back. And when I make it, you're dismissed. Okay. Um, if so we're going to be here for a while, so I hope you got your donut or your breakfast bar or something else. Amen. We're going to be here for a while. It is so good to be with you this morning. It was the first day of training camp, 1961, a long time ago. 38 members of the Green Bay Packer football team gathered and arrived to begin and prepare for a brand new season. The previous year ended pretty poorly. The Packers lost 17-13 to to the Philadelphia Eagles. It was a terrible loss. They squandered the lead. And so this year, the players come and they begin to gather together for the first day of training season. And they're all excited about playing smarter, playing better. And they knew that this year was going to be the year that they were going to win the NFL championship game. And so they were eager. They were excited. They were ready to get started. They were ready to do better, to play harder, to play smarter. They were going to do exactly what the coach wanted them to do. But Coach Lombardi had a different idea. He walked into the locker room that day. How about that? We practiced that all week. That was good. (laughs) Walked into the locker room that day, and he said, Gentlemen, this is a football. And he began with the basics. And he went back to the fundamentals He wasn't worried about executing significant or detailed game plan or or anything like that. He wasn't trying to be out uh, to outsmart any other team. He wanted the team to just get back to the basics, to get back to the fundamentals. Game, team. God's game plan for a a healthy church is what we're going to be talking about over the next four weeks. And and we're going to discover together the fundamentals of what it means to be a healthy church. Now, some of you are going to say, man, this is so basic. This is, this is so elementary, exactly. 
I think every now and then it's good to get back to the basics. Amen? Hold on to that for me, would you? How about that Team Jesus? He's pretty good hands. Amen? That's pretty good. That's pretty good. Thank you, brother. So let's begin with uh, Romans chapter 10 this morning, and let's consider what God's game plan is for his team, the church. The Bible says this in Romans chapter 10. The apostle Paul was writing to the church at Rome. Now, I I say that because I want you to know that Paul was writing to people just like us, okay, a church, a a group of believers just like us. So he was writing to a group in Rome, and he says, dear brothers and sisters, the longing of my heart And my prayer is that the Jewish people might be saved. My people might be in right relationship with God. He said, I know what enthusiasm they have for the honor of God, but it's misdirected zeal. It's it's misdirected. It's misguided. It's, It's not correct. For they don't understand that Christ has died to make them right with God. Circle those three words for me today. Right with God. Circle those three words. Right with God. Paul says, for they don't understand that Christ has died to make them right with God. Instead, they had another plan, another play. They were trying to make themselves good enough to gain God's favor by keeping the Jewish laws and the customs. But that is not God's way of salvation. That's not God's way of salvation. Throughout the centuries, Man has always attempted to figure out how to get to God on his own. And that's true even in our day, in our own culture. People believe that that if I'm good enough, I'll get to heaven. The question is, how do you know if you're good enough? Well, if I have enough points, how do you know if you have enough points? Well, well, if I do more good than bad, who's keeping score? (laughs) Who's keeping score? Some people think that, well, if I go to church, then, then I'm good enough. Then God has to see me going to church, and, and so he'll let me into heaven. Some people believe, this is crazy, that, that if you're born in America, you get an automatic pass. I, I'm an American, therefore I, I get to go to heaven, right? Well, talk to our Canadian friends about that. They might have issue with that. What about the rest of the world? People say, well, well, I was baptized, or I was this, or I was that, and, and, and so I, I, I get to go into heaven, right? I'm a, I'm a nice person. I'm not as mean as they are. <laughs> they say the same thing about you, by the way. <laughs> and so man has always tried to figure out a way to get into heaven. God desires for his people to be in right relationship with him. I had you circle the words right with God. That's what it means to be righteous to be in right standing with God, to be right with God. And God has provided the way to make that possible. I love the end of this verse, but that is not God's way of salvation. Keeping the law, being good, being baptized, being born in America, those are not God's way of being right with him. So the question is asked, what is the right way? What is the right way to be right with God, to be on his team? There's a very familiar passage. I've shared it with you often. It's John chapter 14, verses 1 through 6. Uh, Let me just share it with you. It's not going to be on the screen, or or actually the end of it is, but the whole passage is not going to be on the screen today. It's when Jesus was consoling his followers, his disciples, after he told them in the upper room that he was going to die. Remember, it was the washing of the feet. It was the uh, deception of, of Judas. All of that was taking place in John chapter 13. Jesus said to them that he was going to die. He was only going to be with them a little while longer. Their hearts were broken, and Jesus said in John chapter 14, verse 1, he said, do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. And then he began to talk about heaven. He said, look, I go to prepare a place for you. I'm going to go take care of this. I'm going to to build your mansion for you, your place, your dwelling place, forever and ever and ever in heaven. And I love Thomas' question. Thomas said to the Lord, he said, listen, Jesus, we don't know where you're going. So how can we possibly know the way? And Jesus said this. Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. The what way? The what way? The only way to the Father is through me. Notice Jesus didn't say a way to the Father. It's through Jesus. The, The only way to the Father is through Jesus. So a healthy church has team members who who believe in Jesus Christ as the way to God the Father forever 
and ever and ever. So I want us to talk about two plays today. The first play is this, believing in Jesus Christ. I I want us to have a a complete understanding of what it means to to believe in Jesus Christ, what it means to, to be in right standing with God, not our way, but God's way. So what does it mean to believe in Jesus Christ? Number one, it means that I have trusted in Jesus. Now, now again, I, I know that these are the fundamentals. This is Vince Lombardi holding up the football to experienced professional football players and say, guys, guess what this is? <laughs> this is a football. <laughs> I, I know that's what we're getting at this, mo- at this moment. But we need to start here. It means to, I have trusted in Jesus Christ. I, I want you to notice what Paul writes again in Romans chapter 10, verses 9 through 13. It says, for if you tell others with your own mouth, that's confession, that Jesus is your Lord, that he's your master, that you are following him, that's what that means, that he is our Lord, he's our master, we're following him, he's our leader, and we believe in our hearts that God raised him from the dead, the Bible says you will be saved. You will be in right relationship with God. And then he continues, for it is by believing in his heart, that's trust, That a man becomes right with God, and with his mouth he tells others of his faith. That's confession, confirming his salvation. For the scriptures tell us that no one who believes in Christ will ever be disappointed. And then I love this because he says, it doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what color, what age, uh, where you're from, what nationality. He says, Jew and Gentile are the same in this respect. They all, that's the key word, all, they all have the same Lord, same master, same leader, who generously gives his riches to all those who ask for them. Let's pause there for a moment. Let's pause there for a moment. So Paul is telling us that that a part of of being a, a follower of Jesus Christ, believing in Jesus Christ, is the fact that we've trusted in him. We have placed our faith and trust in him. That is a one time only experience. A one-time only experience. How many of you were born into this world? How many of you were birthed into this world? Please raise your hand. Some of y'all are thinking, I'm not sure I want to answer that one. (laughs) That's not a trick question, okay? It's not a trick question. If you were here, you've been born, amen? If you were here, you've been born. There was a time in your life where you physically came into this world. I happen to know because my mom told me and wrote it on this little ceramic baby, um, and so I know exactly, at 10.02 p.m., at the old Prince George's Hospital that is now closed down, at 10.02 p.m. on October 26, 1968, I was birthed into this world. Hello world, Rick Hancock is here, whether you like it or not. (laughs) There was a time, there was a moment in time where you were birthed into this world, that you were born physically. The Apostle Paul suggests that there has to be a time of rebirth, a spiritual birth. Matter of fact, Jesus in a conversation with the religious leader said as much fellow by the name of Nicodemus came to see Jesus, and they began to talk about spiritual issues, and Jesus really didn't pay much attention to what Nicodemus was saying. He just looked at this guy and said, you must be born again. You must be born again. And Nicodemus was like, what are you talking about? How can I re-enter my mother's womb and be born for a second time? And Jesus said, no, 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 that's, what that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about being born from above. Nicodemus, you were born in this world. Now you have to be born from above. The Word of God teaches us that there is a rebirth experience and that comes through trusting uh, trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ. And I love this next word in this verse. It says, anyone, anyone who calls upon the name of the Lord. Now let's pause there for a moment. Anyone who calls upon the name of the Lord. It it doesn't matter what race, what nationality. It it doesn't matter how old, how young. It it doesn't matter if you you were born and raised in the church. It doesn't matter if you committed the worst of all sins that you can possibly imagine. The Bible says anyone, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved, will be in right relationship with God. So with the mouth, we confess that Jesus is in control, that he is our Lord, he is our master, and we are following him. And the Bible says with our heart, we believe that God raised him from the dead. Now, you've seen football games, and you've seen when the, the kicker is about to kick an extra point or a field goal. Most of the time in most stadiums, you see somebody standing in the back with a sign that says what? 316. 
Now, I love listening to sports talk, and every now and then when there's nothing else to talk about, somebody complains about religious fanatics holding up 316. Here's what I suggest. Get over it. (laughs) Get over it. There, There are numbers all over the field. There are numbers all over the jerseys. There are numbers up on the scoreboard. Why can't there be a number in the stands? And the best number in the world is 316. Because it says this, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, one and only son, that whoever believes, don't you like that? Whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal or everlasting life. And so believing in Jesus means that there was a time where we trusted in God. We placed our faith and trust in God. We were born again. We were born from above. We had this new birth experience. Number two, it also means that I have personally accepted Jesus. I have personally accepted Jesus. I want you to notice what Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says. The Bible says, for it is by grace. Grace, what is that again? It is unearned forgiveness and undeserved love from God. For it is by grace you have been saved, made right with God, through faith, and this is not from yourselves. Now notice the next line. It is the gift of God. It is a gift from God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Now listen, if we have to earn a gift, it's not a gift, right? If we earn something, that's a wage, that's a price paid for, uh, for uh, activity or, or assignment completed. The the Bible says that salvation, uh, being right with God, is a gift from him. It's given to us freely. And so we don't earn a gift, but we do what with a gift? We receive it or we accept it, right? It becomes ours by receiving it. Matter of fact, the Bible says in John 1, 12, as much, yet to all who did receive him, accept him by faith, to those who believed in his name, God gave them the right to become the children of God. Children of God are in right standing with God. We become a part of God's team. Children born not of natural descent, not of human decision or a husband's will, not because of a husband and wife coming together and being intimate, but born of God. Again, making reference to what Jesus said to Nicodemus in John chapter 3. You were born physically into this world. That was because your mother and father came together in intimacy. And now he's suggesting that there is a spiritual birth that takes place. And this is a gift from God that is not earned or credited because of our good works, but given to us because of God's grace. And so for me to be uh, a believer in Jesus Christ, I have to trust in Jesus Christ. I have to accept the gift personally, uh, not what my parents did for me when I was an infant or, or, or my grandmother being a, a religious woman. That has nothing to do with my personal decision to accept Jesus Christ. It is a personal decision. And thirdly, it is I'm following Jesus Christ. I become a follower of Jesus Christ. Now, now notice how this works. I have trusted, I have believed in Jesus. I did that once. I have accepted Jesus, the gift of God. I did that once, and I have decided to follow Jesus. I did that once, and now I continue to follow Jesus. I want you to notice it's a both and. There was a moment in my life where I decided to follow Jesus. There was a moment where, where, where God's conviction, God said, you know what, I, you're not right with me. And, and so I, I came to understand that I believed in him, I accepted him. And there was a moment as a 13-year-old boy that, that I began to follow Jesus Christ. I did that once, and now the rest of my life, I am a follower. If you were a follower of Jesus Christ, you had the same experience. You had the same experience. Now, for me, it was at Landover Hills Baptist Church. It was red carpet. It was right there, basically, where Skip is. (laughs) I was kneeling down at the front with my youth pastor after I've talked to my pastor. He shared the gospel with me, and I gave my life to Jesus Christ. For some of you, it was in the woods. Some of you, it was at home. Some of you, it was in the office. Some of you, it was maybe on a beach somewhere. It doesn't matter where. It just matters that you did it. I want you to notice what the Bible says in Matthew chapter 4. Jesus calls his followers. In the early days of Jesus' ministry, he began to gather his team, his disciples. And the Bible says this, one day as Jesus was walking along the shore of the Sea of Galilee, Jesus saw two brothers, Simon also called Peter and Andrew, throwing a net into the water, for they fished for a living. And Jesus called out to them, come and what? What does it say? Follow me, and I will show you how to fish for people. And they left their nets at once, and what? They followed 
a little farther up the shore, he saw two other brothers, James and John, sitting in a boat with their father, Zebedee, repairing their nets. And he called to them, come, too. And they immediately, what? Followed him, leaving the boat and their father behind. So Peter and Andrew, James and John, teach us a very important principle about what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you something right now that's going to blow you away. You're not going to believe this truth, this insight from the Word of God. Are you ready for this? You're thinking, okay, what is it? You're not going to believe this. Followers of Jesus Christ follow Jesus Christ. Wow! But if you think about it, Wow. 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 I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. Are my thoughts right now lining up with that? I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. Is how I treat my wife or my husband in alignment with that profession? I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. Am I managing my time in light of the truth that I'm a follower of Jesus? I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. Am I, am I speaking words that are in keeping the fact that I'm a follower of Jesus Christ? Don't let the, here's a football, <laughs> lull us to sleep. Followers of Jesus Christ follow Jesus Christ. There is a moment in time where we decide to follow him. And then for the rest of our lives, we follow him. That's what followers do. And here's the result, number four. I have a new life in Jesus. I have a new life in Jesus. So that means that, that trusting and that accepting and that, and that following results in a radically changed life. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, this means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a better person. That's what it says, right? Oh, it says new person. <laughs> yeah, new person. Now, we do become better, <laughs> but because we're new. The Bible says this means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a, a new person. The old is gone and a new life has begun, not just better, but new. Let me illustrate it this way. This past week, we were, if you were a Washington football team fan, you have been longing for years, two years, for the name change, right? We went from the Washington Redskins to the Washington football team, right? I mean, that man, that's pretty catchy, the Washington football team, just in case we forgot what game we were playing. And if you ever watch them, you say, yeah, they did forget from time to time, but, but I digress. And so one of my favorite players, Kirk Cousins, is up there wearing the old Redskin gear. And so for two years, we've been wondering, what are the Redskins going to be called? We have to be something rather than the, than the Washington football team. So we went from the Washington Redskins to the Washington football team. And finally, on Groundhog Day, the most important day of our lives, we found out this, the Washington Commanders. Overwhelming, isn't it? By your response, I, I can just tell. I mean, oh, I, I hope Dan Snyder's not watching this online. It's the same old team with a different name. Not true for the follower of Jesus Christ. We're not the same old person cleaned up. We're in a different jersey. We are a brand new person. The Bible says the old life is gone and the new life has come. Trusting and believing and accepting Jesus as our Savior results in a new life. The Bible teaches us that, that we are a brand new person. We are a child of God. We are part of the family of God. We are invited to, to be a part of the team. We're on God's team. We, we wear Team Jesus, as Skip is wearing for us. Team Jesus, that's who we are a part of today. 
we also have a new position. We are now in right relationship with God, the Bible teaches us. Before, we were the enemy of God, and now we are in right relationship. God, we're a new person, a new position. We have new passions. The four brothers give us, a, give us an example of that. They love to fish. Jesus said, follow me. They left that behind, and they developed a passion for following people. And so as followers of Jesus Christ, there's a, a new passion, new interest, new desires in our life. And I love this. We have a new place that we'll experience forever and ever and ever, and that's a place called heaven. And so what does it mean to be a follower of Jesus Christ? It means we believe, we trust, we accept, we follow. And as a result, there's a brand new life. See, God's team, God's church believes in the Lord Jesus Christ. I am so thankful that one of our core values here at Emmanuel Church is that we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. We believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Because today, if I got up and said we believe in God, and people heard that and did not understand, most people say, well, I believe in God too. And they get to define what God means. Capital G or little g. (laughs) They get to define and shape and mold which God we're talking about. But there's no ambiguity here. We are followers of the Lord Jesus Christ, and because we are followers of God's Son, we also believe, number two, in God's Word. The second play I want us to talk about. God's team, God's church, we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, we believe in the right person, and secondly, we believe in the right things. I'm going to blow your mind with this. Did you know that God wants to talk to you? Isn't that crazy? That God, the creator of the universe, The God who always existed, who exists now and forever will exist, desires to talk to you. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, that long ago God spoke to the fathers through the prophets. But in these last days, the Bible says, he has spoken to us by his son. Actually, the word his is not even there, which makes it even more powerful. The Bible says this, in these last days, God the Father has spoken to us in son, in son language. He sent his son to be the living word for us, and we believe in the word of God. The most common way that God speaks to us is through his word. Listen, church, I understand we're getting back to the basics and the fundamentals here. Some of you are saying, I know this. Praise God you know this. Amen? I'm telling you, there's a generation in our culture today that does not know this. God speaks to us primarily through the Word of God. A lot of people today believe that God speaks to them primarily through experience or by feelings or through nature, and God does that, but primarily He speaks to us through His Word, and the Bible accomplishes two goals. Number one, it declares the method of salvation. The Word of God teaches us in the Old Testament and the New Testament the method of salvation. The Bible says this in Romans chapter 5, verses 8 and 9. But God demonstrated, or God showed his great love for us by sending Christ, Jesus, to die for us while we were still sinners. And since we have been made right in God's sight, don't miss that. Since we have been made right with God's sight, in God's sight, by the blood of Christ, the blood of Jesus, he will certainly save us from God's judgment or condemnation. Why is this important? Why is this important for me to share this with you today? Because many believe that the method of salvation is through works, through goodness, through kindness, uh, by being just a, a good citizen, and all of those things. There are also the people who believe that, that the most important aspect of Jesus is not his death, burial, and resurrection, but his life. Now, his life is critically important. The life of Jesus is absolutely important. That's why we have the four Gospels. That's why we see his his incredible birth and and his early childhood. I wish we knew more about his younger years, don't you? When we get to heaven, we can ask him about that. We have plenty of time. But I would love to have been able to read a little bit more about Jesus' teenage years. That would have been helpful when I was 13, 14, 15, amen? (laughs) Some of you are thinking, oh, boy, that would have been really helpful. The Bible teaches us about his life. It talks about his ministry. It talks about his interaction with people. It talks about his love for people and his care and his concern and and how Jesus wept. It talked about his emotions. We we read the life of Jesus and, and we see his relationship with the Father. The life of Jesus is absolutely essential. But can I tell you this? 
We are not saved through the life of Jesus. We are not made right with God through the life of Jesus. And I know I'm, I'm, I'm really skating on thin ice here because, because the life of Jesus is absolutely essential. Don't miss that. But the Bible clearly says this. And since we have been made right in God's sight by the blood of Christ, the most significant thing Jesus did for us was to die on that cross for you and for me, to be placed in that borrowed tomb and on the third day step out of that tomb, gaining victory over death, not only for himself but for us for all time. The Bible says that we are made right with God through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. The Bible also, number two, declares the mission for followers of Jesus. This is for the saved. It shows his team how to live, how to love, and how to serve in order to please God. The, the method of salvation is the blood of Jesus Christ. The mission for followers is to live like Jesus, how to live, how to love, and how to serve in order to please God. The Bible says in Philippians 2.12, therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but much more in my absence, continue to work out. So if you've been wondering if you should go back to the gym, the Bible just said you should, right there, to work out. Continue to work out. Now, I knew I was preaching this this week, and when I was in the gym, when I had that 20 pounds of weight on that barbell, I mean, and, and I was bench pressing, and that was a lot of weight. I mean, it's 10 on each side. If you think about it, you kind of break it down. I was ready to quit. The Bible says continue to work out your salvation with fear and with trembling. It's a serious business. What is Paul saying? What is he saying? He's not telling us to go to the gym. He said, because you are saved, because you're in right relationship with God, live the rest of your life demonstrating the fact that you are. Work it out. Demonstrate it. Show it. And everything you think, everything you say, everything you do, your investment of time, everything, everything about your life, work it out. And so the word God teaches us that, that we're to show and demonstrate our appreciation and love for God. We call that worship. We're to share our relationship with Christ with others. We call that evangelism. The Bible tells us to grow spiritually. That's discipleship. The Bible tells us that, that we're supposed to serve others, not only here in church but around the world. We call that ministry and missions. And the Bible says that we're to be connected with one another because we are the body of Christ. We're the team. We call that fellowship. The Bible tells us how to live our lives. That's the mission for the followers. The Word of God, finally, is beneficial. Let me share this with you this morning. The Word of God is God's playbook. You ever watch, uh, you ever watch uh, coaches, especially football coaches on the sideline, they, they have these giant cards, and they often hold them over their mouths so that the other team can't see what they're saying because if they can read the lips, then they might be able to pick up the play. And so the coaches will hold the, these giant cards over their mouth, and they're, they're calling in the plays. And, and if you ever look at a, a coach's play sheet, I mean, there's all types of stuff on there. And sometimes if you watch the quarterback, he has a, a wristband, and he, and he pulls that strap back, and, and on that wristband, all of the plays. Now, at 53, I can only have two plays on there because it has to be really big letters. <laughs> but he sees all of those plays on there. The Word of God says that the Bible is God's playbook. And the Bible says that the Word of God is beneficial. There's, it's good for something. Let me conclude with what it's good for. The Bible says in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, that all Scripture, the Bible, is literally God-breathed. Now, in the old King James, it was says given by inspiration. That's good. But God-breathed is more accurate. When we read the Bible, we are actually experiencing the breath of God. That's cool, isn't it? The breath of God. The next time you sit with your phone open or your tablet open or maybe a copy of the Bible open, put it close. You can almost feel the breath. All Scripture is God-breathed, and, and I like this, and it's useful. It's useful. See, see, a lot of people think that the Word of God is outdated. It's, it, it's old school. It's, it, it's no longer a, a part of our society or culture. It, it should not be considered. But, but the Bible says that, that the Scripture is literally the breath of God and is useful for teaching and rebuking and correcting and training 
and righteousness, and circle these two words, so that, here's the purpose of the word of God, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Let's break this down. Let's look at this play for just a second. Number one, the Bible says it's useful for for teaching. The Bible is the source of Christian doctrine. It is the source, not a source, of Christian truth. Now, I went to I went to DeMatha Catholic High School, and we have some stags here today. That's super cool. And when I was in religion class, I remember in 11th grade, Father Claude was our religion teacher. Father Claude was cool. He was Canadian, and uh, and I had a great relationship with him. He had red curly hair, and and he let, let me ask any question. He knew that I attended a Baptist church, and and he knew that our traditions were a little bit different. And every now and then, Father Claude would, would say something, and I would raise my hand, and, and he would call me Hancock. He said, "Yes, Hancock." And I said, Father Claude, where is that found in the Bible? And he would often say, well, it's not in the Bible, it's church doctrine. And he would continue. And then he would say something else, like maybe a few days later, I'd raise my hand. He said, yes, Hancock. I said, well, where is that in the Bible? And he said, that's not in the Bible, that's church doctrine. So I kept asking that question. Finally, one day I raised my hand and he goes, it's church doctrine, Hancock. It's not in the Bible. And I wasn't being sarcastic, I was hungry for the truth. I'm being candid with you. I would go home and talk to my pastor. I'd call him almost every day. He drove him crazy. Pastor Hartsfield, I learned this in religion class. What's right? Pastor Hartsfield never told me who was right. He said, look in the Bible. Always said, look in the Bible. If you're five or six passages of Scripture, figure out what's truth. Never said Baptists were right. Never said Catholics were wrong. He always said, look at the Bible. Look at the Bible. Look at the Bible. So thankful he did that. Father Claude did this this day. He said, Hancock, it's church doctrine. He went to the chalkboard. Remember those? Remember chalkboards? Whiteboards, smart boards for young people. <laughs> and he drew a balance scale. And it had two dishes on either side. You know, you know what I'm talking about. And on one dish, he wrote over top of that dish, church doctrine, Catholic teaching. And then on the other dish, he wrote Bible. Now, now please, if you're watching here or, or you're online, I'm not mocking the Catholic church. This is what he taught me. This is the church's teaching. And he said, on one side, it is what the church teaches. It is our teaching. It is our doctrine. And we believe that is truth. And then on the other side, there is the biblical truth or biblical doctrine. And that's truth. And so I understood. So later when I would raise my hand, he would just say, church doctrine, Bible, church doctrine, Bible. The scripture says that the Bible is useful for teaching. It's beneficial to give us all the doctrine we need. So if you're wondering where we get our doctrine or our teaching from, it's only from the Bible. That is our source of teaching. Number two, it's useful for rebuking. It does two things here. It exposes false teachers. Have you ever listened to a preacher on the radio or maybe saw him on television or you read something that was spiritual and and content and you say, well, that doesn't sound right. That's not right. That's not what I understand to be true. Well, that's the word of God rebuking that false teaching. It exposes what's wrong with false teachers, but it also is useful for personal failures. When we mess up, when we fall short, the word of God is that plumb line. It is that that clear boundary that says, no, you've gone too far. You've messed up. So it's useful for rebuking false teachers, but it's also useful to help correct personal failures. Number three, it's useful for correcting. It restores uh, good doctrine and personal position. It, we know where to go for the truth. The Bible says it is truth. Jesus said this in his prayer. He said, Father, sanctify them in truth. Your word, Father truth and it's also useful for training resulting in righteous living before God number five it changes and equips me for my life's purpose I love what the message paraphrase says here through the word of God we are put together and pastor Stan you'll like this because you teach third base through the word of God we are put together and shaped shaped up for the task God has given to us The Word of God is not meant to give information only, but it's meant to bring transformation in our lives. 
when we come to church, when we sit down in front of the Word of God morning after morning or night after night, the, the purpose of the Word of God is, is not to fill our heads just with good, godly, spiritual information. That's not the only purpose. It is to change our lives, to transform our lives so that we might be equipped to do everything that God wants us to do. And so it's all about transformation and a little less about information. So here are the fundamentals. Here's the football. God's team believes in the right person, the Lord Jesus Christ. And God's team believes in the right things which is the truth of God's word. Check this out. God's team is a group of baptized believers who have joined together in a commitment to help each other fulfill God's purpose for their lives according to the truth of God's word. My friends, that is as basic and as fundamental as it gets. But here's my question for you. Are you a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ? Have you accepted and believed Have you trusted? Are you following Jesus? And as a follower of Jesus Christ, are you in the book, in the word, so that it might change you and equip you to do everything that God has called you to do in this world? Let's pray together. Father, we're thankful for your word, thankful for your truth. God, I pray today that we would all be able to say without any doubt in our mind that I am a follower of Jesus Christ because I believe I I, I received, I accepted Christ, and I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. I know that beyond any shadow of a doubt. I am right with God because of what Jesus Christ did for me and by the fact that I received that gift personally. God, I pray that that is true for all of us. And I pray, Father, for this church that we would be faithful to the word of God, that we would always believe in the right stuff, the right things, the right truth. Lord, I know the world would love to pull us away. God, I pray that we would be fully committed to the truth of your word. As you're seated with your heads bowed and your eyes closed today, let me ask you this, my friend. Has there ever been a time where you believed and trusted and accepted the Lord Jesus Christ? Was there a moment in time that you left your nets behind, your boat behind, your life behind, and you made a decision to follow the Lord Jesus Christ? If not today, you can say yes to him. Pray something like this. Dear God, the best way I know how right now, I'm saying yes, yes, I believe, I trust, I want to follow, I want you to lead, I want you to be my God, I want to be your child, I want to be on your team. God, today I place my faith and my hope in you, and I pray this with joy in Jesus' name, amen. I want you to take your connection card very quickly, and I want you to look at the next steps on the bottom left-hand corner. Number one, if you made a decision to follow Christ today, please let us know that, either online or here on campus. We would love to rejoice with you and celebrate with you. We also want to help you in your new journey with Jesus Christ. Number two, this is really important. Uh, I will register for First Base, which is our membership class for March 6th. Now listen carefully. This is really important. This is brand new for 2022. We are going to offer First Base in the morning, not at night, on Sunday, on March 6th. It's going to be from 9 o'clock in the morning to 11 o'clock in in the morning. So from 9 to 11, we're going to offer First Base. We're going to meet in the video venue And so some of you can't come back on Sunday night. We totally get that. So we're going to try to make it as easy and as convenient for you as possible. And so I'm going to be teaching most of it. And uh, I'm going to have some help during the uh, the interim. And so we also have child care available. So that takes that excuse away. So we're going to take care of your children. We're going to provide the opportunity on Sunday morning. So March 6th, if you've never taken first base, we would love for you to register for that so that you can become a member of Emmanuel Church. Number three, I will begin reading God's Word daily. And we can help you with that if you are not in the habit of reading God's Word. God's Word. We have devotionals out on the guest table, which is right out on the foyer on the right-hand side. Pick up your free copy of your devotional. You can begin reading tonight or first thing tomorrow. Let's continue in our worship. Stand with me, if you would, please. Amen. I hope you guys, those of you out there that needed to make that decision today, I hope you made that decision and you became a believer. Let's sing our praise to him. I walk a bit different now, now that my heart's been found, nothing really feels the same. I hold my head a bit high, I lift my voice a bit louder, yeah, something inside has changed. 
I am a mountain mover, water walker, more than just an overcomer, cause I've been set free. I am a gospel preacher, heart on fire, freedom singing, testifier, cause I've been redeemed. I am a believer. I know this is not my home I know I don't walk alone No matter what comes my way I have peace through the trouble I have joy through the struggle And now my hope's in a brighter day Come on, let's sing it. I am a mountain move a water walker More than just an overcomer Cause I've been set free I am a gospel preacher, heart on fire, freedom singing, testifier, cause I've been redeemed. an overcomer cause I've been set free yeah I am a mountain mover water walker more than just an overcomer cause I've been set free I am a gospel preacher heart on fire freedom singing testifier cause I've been set free I am a believer Amen. If you're a believer here today, say amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Hey, let me just remind you uh, that we do have a night to shine coming up this Friday night. Now listen, if, if you're new to Emmanuel Church, and many are, you're thinking, what is night to shine? It is our opportunity as a church family, as a team, to show our love and respect and our acceptance of a community that has often neglected those with special needs. And often, in the past, we, we would turn this worship center into a dance floor, and it was incredible. It was a prom-like experience. It was amazing with tuxedos and limos and the whole deal. But because of COVID, uh, the national organization, Tim Tebow's foundation, uh, is asking every church, every organization all around the world to do a drive through again this year. It breaks our heart because it's not as intimate, it's not as fun, but it is our opportunity to show a community that is often neglected by faith communities just how much we love our families here in our community. So if you're not a part of this, uh, just check on that uh, box, or if you'd like to know more on the back of the car, just check uh, Night to Shine, and uh, Christine or somebody from the team will reach out and get you plugged in. You will never forget your experience this coming Friday night with Night to Shine. It's going to be an incredible, incredible opportunity. Also, let me just remind you to continue giving to the offering. Uh, there are ways to give. You can see that online. Many of you give online. Thank you for doing that. But if you use your offering envelope, uh, thank you for doing that. Thank God for your, uh, for your continued faithfulness. Because of your gifts, we can do ministries like Night to Shine and Safe Nights, uh, great opportunities to reach out to our community. So it's not just about painting the walls and cleaning the carpets. It's about reaching people for Jesus Christ. And if you look on the back of your bulletin, you'll notice an update for our Family Life Center. Uh, you have given over three hundred and ten thousand dollars in less than a year amen that's incredible that is unbelievable so we are we are well within target so if you are uh, if you're giving on a regular basis thank you for doing that if you got a little behind during the christmas season totally understandable use these next few weeks to get caught up and if this is brand new to you like what is the family life center what is the continuing division uh see me after the service and i'll give you one of our brochures to let you know exactly what uh we're talking about we're going to build a 12,000 square foot building right back there uh behind the parking lot 
Lord willing, beginning in May. That's what we were told this past week. So things are coming together, and we're really excited about this opportunity. So we want you to be a part of that. And I wanted to thank you uh, so much for giving that much money during a COVID season. That is pretty, pretty incredible. Listen, if you are a guest with us today, thank you for being here. Thank you for being a part of our new series. Thank you for coming to Emmanuel Church. A lot of great churches in the areas, and we just know that uh, by coming here, we're blessed, and we're so thankful that you came. We want to do a couple things. We want to thank you by giving you some, some resources, some gifts, and so as you walk out the door on the right-hand side, underneath the monitor, uh, you'll see a beautiful table with all types of uh, items on display. They're all for you. Just take as much as you want. Um, you can take one of each, really. Just take as much as you want. We just want to say thank you for coming. If you gave your life today, to Christ for the very first time. We have a new believer's Bible. We want to give that to you. That's free of charge. And then the second thing we want to do with all of our guests and with all of our friends, we want to spend time with you back in our Welcome Center. It's our fellowship halls where we have coffee and uh, I was going to say donuts. Man, I wish I had a donut, but that sounds good. And we have breakfast bars and all types of good stuff back there. It's all free. Just gives us a chance to spend some time with one another. We would love the opportunity to get to know you personally. God's been good, hasn't he? All right, so here's the game plan. We, we're all warmed up, right? We're not ready to hit the showers and call it quits. We're ready to go play the game now. This is all stretching. This is all pregame stuff, all right? The real game happens when we walk out the doors because that's where they need our Jesus. So let's say it together. Emmanuel, let's go be the church. God bless you. Have a great week. Have you been hearing the same old voice tell the same old lies? If you're trying to fill the same old hole inside, well, there's a better life, there's a better life. If you got pain, he's the pain taker.